um, the general manager at uh, Canadian Dairy Network, uh, secretary treasurer and general manager at, uh, up in Guelph. Uh, and certainly Brian and I have uh, had, uh, had the pleasure to work together uh, in the past. And I don't think that uh, I know of anybody within our industry in Canada, uh, Brian, that uh, wears a flag uh, with that big maple leaf on it any prouder than you do um, at home and, uh, and as you travel as well. And certainly that uh, you carry that flag well and uh, certainly the industry that you represent in Canada um, with that being the only organization that uh, has all those partners involved, you certainly carry that with a lot of pride and uh, it certainly reflects in your passion as well. So your words uh, of strength and experience here are certainly going to be so welcome and it is a pleasure to uh, introduce you. So please give Brian Van Dormo from CDN a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, I realize why I've been invited to speak uh, here today to you and that was so that uh, Roger and Jeff and the organizers could say it was truly an international event. I hope I can contribute to the information that we're sharing and uh, make people think a little bit more uh, about genetics and genomics and, and the future. Uh, a few brief words on Canadian Dairy Network because I'm in the US and it may not be as well known. Uh, we're celebrating our 20th year of, since its creation, and uh, I was the first employee of CDN 20 years ago in the management position. So yes, uh, I've had that honor for, for that time period. I empathize with Zhao in his role as the CEO of, of CDBC because the only difference is they're just 18 years later. Uh, in establishing an organization responsible for genetic evaluation services with a funding strategy of industry partners paying and working collaboratively with a government body to do the R&D and feeding into the system. So, uh, yeah, I have had the experience of those evolutions in time. Uh, maybe my transition from government to industry was maybe a little easier than Zhao's in the sense that we are a smaller industry, but it was only traditional evaluations as well, whereas now with genomics, things are really, really changed. And we do have new players. So uh, um, basically, uh, my, my presentation today is, is, is profitable genetics uh, in Canada. And uh, what are our priorities? And we can ask the question, what, what really is profitable genetics? And, and in Canada, most of our organizations are not for profit. So the profit that we're focusing on is the profit of the dairy producers, of the breeders, of our animals. And our focus as industry is to deliver programs, products, and services that help them be profitable. And so to do so, CDN has to provide accurate genetic evaluations for economically important traits. I, I like what Zhao said a moment ago as it relates to the U.S. industry as well. I think somewhere in between his lines there, he was saying that in the U.S., uh, your evaluations nationally have a tremendous important responsibility on progress in, in the U.S., but also around the world. So if you want dairymen to be profitable, you need to make sure they're going to make the right genetic decisions, and accuracy is important. And uh, erroneous genetic decisions lead to suboptimal profit at the farm level. So that's, uh, that's an important message that we recognize at CDN in, in the Canadian environment. Uh, this morning, I'll also talk to you about uh, a new profit-based selection index uh, that we'll be introducing in August of 2015. I took this slide or made this slide just to show uh, the dairy cattle population size of different countries. These are the countries, there are other big, big, huge countries, but these are the countries with national genetic evaluation systems that participate in Interbol and are more or less advanced in that sense. U.S. having 9.2 million dairy cows, and you can go down on the population size by country to the little red box in the bottom corner where Canada has 
And if I rounded it up, we have a million. 968,000 dairy cows. Um, so I could get one, one in there rounded. Um, bottom line being is that we are neighbors. Uh, we work well together. But the U.S. is so much bigger than, than Canada. And we have to find a way in Canada to make sure that our dairymen are profitable and competitive. In terms of exports, uh, Canada exports uh, a substantial amount of genetic material. This is embryos, live cattle, and semen. And of all of the dairy exports in 2014, 67% went to the U.S. So the U.S. is a huge marketplace, a market environment for dairy genetics out of Canada. And then you could see the order of the other countries going down, but none nearly as close as what the U.S. is to the Canadian industry. And it represented 44% of all of the dairy genetic exports. But in the other way, Canada exported 11 million back. So there is a fair exchange of genetic material between the two countries. Um, and, and, and as Zhao presented in his, in a slightly different manner, uh, both Canada and the US have a tremendous uh, uh, market establishment for genetic material in other countries around the world. And I would say, uh, no disregard to the US industry, it's normal that you should have the largest share on an international marketplace. What isn't perhaps normal in those statistics that Zhao showed is the significant portion that Canada has had for being such a small country. We have at least 15 to 20 percent of the international market share in genetics, and we're such a small country, that's a huge success. So what are our success factors in Canada? And the first, I have to say, is the high producer participation in all of our breed improvement programs. I don't know why this happened or why this has been the case, uh, but it, has, it is the way it is. We obviously have over 90% AI usage. 72% of all cattle in Canada are registered in the Breed Association herd books. 75% of all cows are on DHI, of which 85% of those contribute to genetic evaluations. 89% of herds that are on DHI also type classify. There are no incentives in any of these programs from government or any place else, and especially nowadays, even from the AI sector, to maintain this. Dairymen are on these programs because they see value in participating in these programs to help them make money in terms of herd management. They don't participate in these programs for genetic improvement. They participate in these programs for herd management. And the byproduct is that we get to use those phenotypes, that data, for genetic evaluations. That's the byproduct, not the original source. The second most important uh, success factor in Canada is a unified collaborative industry. And this goes back a long, long time, but has surely been accentuated within the CDN structure. And I expect it will be accentuated within the CDBC structure in the next 20 years in the US. AI, breeds, DHI, and all milk marketing organizations across the country are all under one umbrella called CDN for dairy cattle improvement. In fact, I could go so far as to say we used to have an NAAB equivalent. It's gone. We used to have an equivalent that brought all breed associations together. That's gone. These layers between the CDN umbrella and the actual partners have all disappeared because they see themselves as partners under the CDN umbrella. Just last week or two weeks ago, before I went to Germany, we had an industry visioning and strategic planning session. I think it's normal that every organization does strategic planning to position themselves, to find out where their goals are, what are their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And every organization will do that to position themselves for the future. In Canada, what we've been doing is industry strategic planning. There were all of the major AI organizations who are competitors nationally and internationally were in the room saying, how can we do better in Canada as Canada? 
as an industry in terms of genetic improvement to the betterment of the, of the dairyman. We consistently seek efficiencies, both in terms of structures and services. So how do we deliver services better, more effectively, more unified? What structures can we get rid of? Every board of directors and every CEO that we can get rid of saves the farmer money. Fact of the matter. And every time we can, we can get rid of IT systems and more and more databases and computer hardware and software, we save the producer money. So structure efficiencies are very important. The dairyman is buying our services as an investment in his welfare and we want to give him the best return on that investment by reducing the costs of our industry structure and the service delivery. Other success factors include state-of-the-art genetic evaluations. We were one of the first countries to have the test day model, for example, for production traits. And I could go on and list Canada developed MACE and, and it got used internationally into Interval. And, and we have many genetic evaluation systems in Canada that are state-of-the-art. And it's basically science that leads to implementation. You do have the same in the US. I'm not ignoring that. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying that it is a contributing factor of why any, any country has success factors. We also are introducing, we introduce, continue to introduce genetic evaluations for new or novel traits. The last two examples were body condition score and clinical mastitis, which is now part of a mastitis resistance index that combines it with somatic cell. We have industry investment in high priority areas of R&D, research and, co and development, coordinated by CDN. So as part of our fees in, 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 in CDN, the fee structure actually collects money that actually goes to a pot that is specifically identified for R&D. It, it funds research carried out by government and university scientists outside of CDN, outside of our industry. So we act as a coordinator and a facilitator to identify high research priority areas and then fund that research in the different universities. So some of the ones that are just in progress and, and, and will lead to real solid outcomes in the next five years are, are hoof health, feed efficiency, nutraceutical properties of milk, and, and others. And another success factor is that we continually strive to ensure that our genetic evaluations are unbiased. And, and as Zhao said, that is a continuous effort all the time. We constantly need to make sure that what we're delivering are accurate and unbiased evaluations. So on that note, we talk about the overestimation of genomic evaluations. This was a problem to one degree or another in every country with gen when genomics was first introduced. The US, Canada, I think we can admit that, and every other country. Of course, the consequence of that is that the highest young bulls that were initially ranked back in 2009 and 2010, then they drop when uh, they're higher ranked than proven sires, but then subsequently they drop once milking daughters are, are, are included into their proof. And so that creates an image that what we published in 2009 and 2010 was inaccurate compared to today, and maybe it wasn't optimal. But we've continued to make improvements in our system since then, so we can't just extrapolate what we published in, in 2010 to 2014 or 2015 and say, well, that's still the case. We're continually improving that overestimation of genomic evaluations. Before genomics, parent averages were overestimated too. Everybody knew that. And it was true for basically all young sires, definitely the ones of the greatest interest. But that mattered less because they were not directly compared or ranked alongside the proven sires. You were either making a decision as a producer to say, I want to breed this cow to a proven sire, and then I'm going to look at my proven sire list, or I'm going to use young sires, and I'm going to look at this young sire list. But now, we're looking at ranking them side by side and making decisions amongst the pool of one common uh, product line, a, a sire, a, a, a bull to use in my herd. And of course, the young sires were lower priced and associated with AI young sire incentives, so we got to use a lot of young sires, and we really didn't care back then the fact that their parent averages were over-evaluated. 
Biased genomic evaluations may arise in, in two ways. The first is that there's bias in their traditional genetic evaluations, EBVs in Canada or PTAs in the U.S., that are used as input to calculate genomic predictions, as well as the blending or combining processes that we have to, to yield the, the published GEBVs or GPTAs. So if there's bias in your traditional evaluations, that bias will be fed through your genomic system and, and lead to bias in the outcomes. And the other thing are imperfect or suboptimal genomic evaluation methods and procedures. Not everything is perfect from the day one, and we continue to improve our methodologies. So we have, a, we have been aggressively addressing both poss possible sources of bias. And uh, one of the most important from a technical application perspective, not to be discussed in this room, uh, is technical, is the deregression procedures that we've been using. And we are implementing improved deregression procedures in April. The two that are of more importance from an industry perspective are the adjustment to EBVs or PTAs for, for preferentially treated cows or you could say differentially treated cows. Some cows that got better management or poorer management, or some heifers that got better or poorer management uh, because, uh, because of, for, for whatever reason, cow family or, or, or interest. And also the adjustment to EBVs or proofs for sires that are not yet randomly used in Canada. So this is the normal distribution Statistics, geneticists, we call this, and typically you would know it as the bell curve. And it's nice and perfect and is equally distributed on both sides of the curve away from a middle of mean of zero. And that's how genetic evaluations and PTAs are expressed in the US. So this shows the expected distribution of the difference between a cow's PTA and her sire pedigree stack pedigree index. So you could take her sire, her maternal grandsire, great maternal grandsire, great great maternal grandsire, down that pedigree stack and you can calculate a, a, a pedigree index using her sire stack lineup and that is her estimate based on what her sire makeup is of a pedigree index and then her evaluation should deviate from that in a normally distributed manner, either above it or below it. And, and so, giving this hypothesis then, we look at what actually is happening in the red curve was the non-normal distribution of cow evaluations in Canada. You can see that there is an unexpected distribution at the high end. These cows that have received some a differential treatment are over-evaluated on the high end of the scale and so the curve is skewed to the right. So what we're trying to do in our methodology of normalization is to move that curve back down. So the adjustment is not necessarily a fixed adjustment per cow. It varies on how far she deviates from her pedigree index. And uh, basically that deviation would change or has to fit in a normal distribution. So you're normalizing the distribution of the difference between a cow's PTA and her sire pedigree index. When we did that, this curve shows 3 million cows, 3 million dots. So there's lots of dots over top of the other ones. A lot of cows at that zero, not affected by anything. But basically, you can see there's a whole group of cows that were at the high end of our LPI list. Remember, this is all before genomics. This is before you feed into genomics. And we had high-end cows that had, you know, L uh, LPIs over 3,000, 4,000. But there were these other cows over 2,000 as well. And that basically, when we adjusted for this normalization, they, uh, they dropped up to 400, 100 to 400 LPI points. So clearly all of those cows had 
a, 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 a bias, in an overestimation of their EBV compared to the expectation of the distribution of the difference between her, her EBV or PTA and, and her pedigree index. You also see on the, on the left here, there are some cows that actually uh, increased using this. They had an underestimation. And that happens too. Sometimes you get cows that for one reason or another uh, didn't perform up to par or didn't have a genetic evaluation uh, up to par uh, and, and basically may have actually been especially, especially treated in a negative sense to boost deviations of herd mates. And in this sense, you, you also move those cows into a higher level uh, it doesn't affect many cows out of the three million here, but it does affect key cows that are bull dams and the, and the matriarchs of our cow families. Remember, this is before genomics, and the good news is that with genomics, a lot of these blue dots in that green circle on the high end were already moved a lot closer they were already moved a lot closer to a normal distribution because the genomics, it does not include, in Canada, does not include their own evaluation. It, genomics is based on the information we know about its genotype uh, male ancestors that are proven. In terms of handling sires with semen that's non-randomly used, uh, this has been a general ongoing problem for some sires with imported semen for, for a long, long time. It's these high-priced sires, high, sires with high-priced semen or some limited availability. Sometimes it's a health status issue. I remember Durham and B.W. Marshall, semen couldn't come into Canada, but the daughters could. Their embryos could. An import of daughters leads to a biased evaluation in Canada, uh, you know, of those kind of bulls. So there are different reasons why bulls used uh, based on imported semen can have non-random usage. And the most recent examples were shuttle, man, oh man, snowman, and you know the list of bulls. So uh, I'll, I'll quote shuttle briefly. When he was first proven in Canada in April of 2009, uh, he ended up with an LPI that was like, I don't know, a thousand points higher than number two bull, if I remember correctly. And within a year, he dropped 1,500 LPI points. He was still a top five LPI bull but he shouldn't have been that high on the number one list. And that's due to non-random usage and, and, and preferential treatment of his daughters. Snowman, clearly the same kind of example in every country. Limited supply, specific ways the semen was sold and used and, and, and whatnot. And it's very difficult to have an accurate genome, a genetic evaluation, traditional evaluation of snowman in any country when his, when his semen and his daughters were treated so specially in any herd that they were had. The problem has now also been amplified and moved also into this group of non-random usage of semen from elite genomic young sires. You know all these bulls. The bulls themselves that have been marketed with only limited supply for a time region, a time period, a limited access of semen, or high price, when you sell the semen, very high price, they're not going to be used. Just the high promotion, high hype genomic bulls are not going to be used randomly like in a traditional young sire proving program before genomics. So it's a challenge from the CDBC or CDN perspective to have an accurate evaluation on those bulls because our models assume that all herd mates are treated equally and, and fairly. And when you don't treat herd mates equally and fairly, then there is a bias that introduced and we can't, we can't remove that bias very easily. So both groups of these sires, for both of them, proof accuracy is critically important, especially now with genomics. Because these overrated proven sires affect the genomic predictions and lead to overestimation of the direct genomic values of their sons and daughters. And these proven sires aren't even the sires of our bulls that we're buying or offering today. They're the grandsires. 90% uh, or more of all young bulls being bought and sold today have an unproven genomic sire. And so 
that just trickles through and you have overestimation in your progeny proofs, you're going to have bias of those sons and grandsons and you're going to lead to wrong decisions. Wrong decisions means reduced profitability at the farm level, also at the AI level. So we tried hard to come up with a way to look at uh, how we can account for this preferential treatment in some manner. And uh, we do understand that the genetic evaluation systems, animal model, accounts for the genetic level of mates. You know, the dams of the daughters. We know if a bull is, is, is used randomly or not randomly, and they're used more on higher, higher, better dams or in better herds, our models can account for that non-random usage in terms of selection of mates and herds. That's not the issue. What we can't account for is how the subsequent daughters from those matings are, 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 are how we can uh, what we are treated as they grow up. If daughters of all bulls were just treated equally in any heifer pen, then we wouldn't have a problem. But the minute that we know that those are daughters of a particular sire in that heifer pen, and I'm going to treat them a little differently, then I'm going to run into a problem in our genetic evaluations. So, so daughters of sires not randomly used are more likely to be treated in a special manner. And so we looked at many different indicators, indicators to try and identify those sires that are most likely going to have preferentially treated daughters. In the end, the one indicator that we found quite successful was the percentage of embryo transfer daughters that they have in their milk proof. Snowman has 98, 99% of all of his daughters in Canada are from ET. Shuttle started with the same thing at the very beginning. Uh, Manoman started with 85% of his daughters in Canada were from ET, flushes. So those first daughters, if you've invested in the dam, you've invested in the ET, you've, you've got full brothers maybe in an AI program, nobody who owns those daughters is going to just treat them like a rough, any heifer in the pen. And so what we had done was we looked back in time. We went back to say, we've always, always had imported semen in Canada. We've always had proofs of bulls with imported semen. So we looked at what was the association when they were first proven and their proof and the percentage of ET daughters in that, in, that they had in that proof versus when their, daughters, their proof was based on many, many daughters widespread use of the bulls eventually, and the percentage of ET daughters in the proof dropped. Gradually over time, when a bull gets more broadly used, the percentage of ET daughters, maybe not in Snowman's case, but in most bulls' cases, uh, for example, Man -O Man is now less than 50%. And it eventually happened that he'll have more broad usage and a lower percentage of his daughters in the proof are ET, ET source daughters. So what we found was there was a nice relationship between how high, how, what the percentage of ET daughters that they had versus the drop that their proof realized over time. So that was an estimate of the overprediction that we originally started with. And so now we have a mechanism in place to, that we implement that we adjust proofs, traditional proofs coming out of our systems before they go into genomics, we account and we adjust those proofs for milk fat and protein, as well as the five major type traits. And this basically is what ends up happening on an LPI scale. We do it on a trait by trait basis. So daughter, bulls with 30% ET daughters or less have no adjustment. Even Goldwyn has almost 30% of his daughters are ET in Canada, but he's got tens of thousands of daughters. We don't expect bias or preferential treatment be affecting his proof, as an example. But bulls that have over 31%, for every percent, uh, there's roughly a five-point drop in their LPI. If you want to add up milk fat, protein, conformation, mammary system, feet and legs, dairy strength and rump in our LPI, it equates to roughly five points. And a bull that has 100% of his daughters are ET will get an adjustment downward of around 350, 355 LPI points. 
which is exactly what happened to Snowman when he was first proven in April of 2014. If we didn't have this adjustment in place, he would have been a, a shuttle repeated, where he would have had an LPI 400 points higher than he did, 350, and he was still our number one LPI bull in that time. But it's better, and, as, and we've already pre-accounted for that, and that meant his progeny, his sons and his daughters were not overestimated Maybe they're still overestimated to some degree, but not by that degree uh, in terms of their genomic evaluations. So new opportunities with genomics. Before the genomic era, young sires were primarily selected based on parent average. I used to work 10 years in the AI industry, and uh, I know very well how, to, how we were selecting young sires. But a lot of AI companies were, you know, looking at parent average, some genetic information, no question cow family, cow performance, sire stack, all those other criteria, the classifications of those, I'm not denying that. But really there was a genetic component to the selection of the vast majority of young sires. And when you had a team of full brothers there, you kind of went eeny, meeny, miny, moe, and you picked the one that looked the best. Basically, when you had foreign young sires born in some other country and you wanted to think about buying them into the U.S. marketplace or into a Canadian stud, was much more difficult. You needed to kind of look at that dam's EBV or PTA on the other country scale, maybe convert it to Canadian scale or the U.S. scale using MACE conversions, and then develop a parent average on our national scales, etc. But really, we, all, we, weren't, we were afraid to do that because, uh, in some countries because we needed to trust that their national genetic evaluation system was as good as ours. So if you felt that you were looking at a cow family in another country that genetic evaluations weren't all that good, then maybe you didn't even touch those because you don't know how good the dams really are or how the evaluations really are. Now with genomics, you can pull DNA from any animal in any country. And that DNA can be used and brought over here and genotyped, included in your CDBC system or in our CDN system, and, and we share the exact same database, exact same genotypes, not the same database, but same information in both databases. So really we have a truly a borderless world of Holstein genetics. You can pull hair on an animal in some strange, underdeveloped country and find out that, you know, Wherever, they may have great genetics in non-registered herd or registered herds. It really doesn't matter anymore. You pull hair, you bring it into your system, and you have an idea of the best genetics where they are. In terms of progress in Canada, this is the genetic progress uh, of, 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 due to genomics. We introduced it in 2009 as well. And you could see that genetic trend was fairly consistent year after year up until 2009 and right now. This is genetic progress achieved in our female population, cows and heifers. And basically, the rate of genetic progress has truly doubled in Canada, from a, a 54 LPI points per year to now 108. That's exactly doubled. And it's going to go even faster. It's doubled now in the first five years. In terms of young, young sires, are, are similar to the U.S. story, the market share of genomic young sires is now 57% in Canada in 2014. <laughs> What's of interest, perhaps, is that that bull we used to call the second crop bull, that was nine years of age of older and had thousands or hundreds of thousands of daughters, he's moved from something like 8% of the market share down to 1% or 2%. Nobody's even looking at those old bulls anymore. And Barely 43% of them are still looking at progeny proven sires. We learned at Interbowl last week there are some countries around the world that are now 95% young sire usage, genomic young sire usage. 95. Other countries are still 50, 55. We're kind of in between in the US and Canada, close to 60%. But that's the evolution that's happening. We need to make sure these genomic evaluations are correct. In terms of the offering given to Canadian dairymen, not every bull bought by AI companies in North America are sold in Canada. The yellow on the bottom shows the number 
of bulls offered in Canada as young sires. In, before genomics in 2009, we were roughly at 400 bulls, and now, since then, we're still at 400 bulls. I know some companies are buying fewer bulls, but what we're seeing is that more companies are selling bulls in Canada because it's so easy to do so now. We have genomic evaluations on a Canadian scale, and we've maintained the same number of bulls being offered to Canadian dairymen. They, they may be from different companies and different organizations. There may be new players in it, but the number of bulls offered to them is the same as it has been before. But look at the genetic quality of those genetics, increasing by 190 LPI points a year on average in the last three years. And that's just going to continue faster and faster. This is a plot that basically shows uh, each dot there and many, many dots behind it, all genotyped Holstein young sires born in 2012 that were genotyped in North America that we have in our respective databases. So there's a roughly, I think, 20,000, 23,000 genomic young bulls that were genotyped. Call these the candidate bulls, okay? And on the bottom scale is their LPI, the GLPI for those candidate bulls. And then you can see there's the difference from their parent average. So some of them inherited genes and genetics that were better than their parent average and they should be above the zero. And others inherited uh, genetics that were poorer than their parent average and they're below the zero. So the zero line is pretty much in the middle of all of those. And that's normal, that's what we would like to see, that equal number of bulls genotyping to be better than parent average compared to those that are genotyping poorer than parent average. In fact, these red ones are the red ones that were candidate bulls not bought by AI companies. The blue ones were the ones that the AI companies in North America subsequently bought. And you can see on the right hand of your screen there, there are still some red ones that were very high for GLPI that were never bought. So there's maybe reasons for that. I don't know that there are reasons. There's sometimes competitiveness, pull brothers, uh, able, uh, the ability to make a deal. Maybe they, maybe they just didn't pass a health test or whatever reason. I'm, I'm not saying that that's possible. And then here is the, in green, the offering given to Canada. So in 2012, there were those three, 400 bulls that were being offered, and they're on that list there. So uh, that's the group of bulls. So what I want to say is that, you know, if you really want to do better in Canada, there's a lot of other bulls that could be sold in Canada. The green ones, there's a lot of blue ones that have been purchased that have very high GLPIs and never been even used in Canada, not offered here. So, they must have either a GTPI that's pretty good too, and they're picking which countries to sell them in, but I'm just saying that you can do better in leading to the profitability of farmers. This is a zoom in on all those bulls that are over 3,200, and that's clearly where you can see those red candidate bulls that were very high on GLPI and never bought. So selection decisions aren't always uh, you know, there are missed opportunities in those selection decisions. So, young sire selection in Canada looking forward. The LPI, or Lifetime Profit Index, has, was introduced, you know, in 1991, so many years ago, almost 25 years ago. Um, I was there when we built that index at the very beginning and all we had was a couple of production traits and a couple of type traits and that was our LPI formula. The aim has always been to provide an index that helps producers and breeders improve traits that are associated with lifetime profit. That's always been our goal. The LPI has a component looking for high production. Another component that says they want them long lasting, we want longevity. And the third component is we want to reduce the costs associated with reproductive failure or health and, and health events or disease events. So the LPI formula has evolved over time and the process for consultation with the industry partners on LPI modifications can be a lengthy one in Canada. 
We've been working on the current changes to LPI for probably three years now. And there are extenuating factors about why it's taken so long to reach that uh, implementation in August. But part of it is the fact that we want to agree as an industry. The LPI formula is a decision of the CDN Board of Directors. And the CDM board chooses and designs and defines the LPI formula in each breed after consultation with the breeds, with the AI industry, and of course its own genetic evaluation board, which is an advisory committee on genetic improvement systems in Canada. So lifetime profit has various definitions, and we're looking to say we want to define lifetime profit. Not all breeders and producers have the same sources of revenue. And the easiest example is to say, well, there's guys that just have a milk check, and then there are other people who are merchandising genetics and can make a substantial source of revenue from that. So revenue isn't the same for everybody, and I would say that maybe expenses aren't neither. So basically, uh, when we did strategic planning for CDN in early 2014, the board of directors was mandated by the industry and that mandate was given to me as manager to explore the development of a second national selection index in addition to LPI that would aim to maximize herd profitability for commercial dairy producers. So, commercial dairy producer. First thing we did was we went and we conducted surveys with the six major AI companies in Canada, especially the people that were involved with mating programs, on-farm consultation and saying, I meet with many, many, many different producers and I got a good sense of what they're looking for. We had a standard set of questions, it's a survey questionnaire kind of thing. The information that we received back was quite varied. It was very detailed responses. Some AI companies said, this is the profile, this is how much weight they want on each trait when we call commercial dairymen, and other ones were more, these are generally the traits that they're looking for. So very diver diverse, but the definition of commercial also differed from company to company. And bottom line is that larger herds are almost always commercial, not always, but almost always commercial, but not all commercial herds are large. You have many herds, many dairy operations across either country, US or Canada, that only make money from the milk check. And that's what we call commercial, not large. Functional traits in these herds are generally more important than what we have been using and including in our LPI. So they felt some kind of disassociation or lack of lack of uh, buy-in to the LPI, that's not for me as a commercial dairyman. And commercial producers want to speak in dollars. They want to know how much money am I going to make if I use this sire or that sire. So we went on into a research project and the first step was defining the profit equation. So in Canada we have two DHI service providers. One's called CanWest, and they service Ontario West, and the other is called Valacta, and they serve the province of Quebec and East. But they are common together under an umbrella called Canadian DHI, and they share one centralized database for processing all of the DHI data, and producing all of their reports and all of their services are from one centralized database. They jointly provide their customers across Canada with a profitability report for each cow, as well as a herd summary profitability report. This information is an excellent source of profit values nationally. Now, from a CDN perspective, we know there's profit calculations done by an industry partner that farmers have already been receiving if they're a client of DHI, which is 85% of our herds. 75% of our herds, excuse me. The economic parameters in these profit equations are updated by economists and experts each year. And the DHI provides a cumulative, accumulated uh, profit values to each calving. So you can imagine 
when a heifer calves for the very first time, it's called rearing cost. There is no profit yet. It's all a negative cost, that first calving. And then you accumulate profit to second calving, third calving, fourth calving, and onward you go. And herd owners can then define which cows have been making them money when you compare third calvers to, together or fourth calvers together or second calvers together, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually look at which cows are making you money in your herd. So their profit equation is, is, is fairly simple but comprehensive at the same time. Obviously on the income side, you have revenue milk based, based on our milk pricing systems in Canada, kilos of fat, kilos of protein, kilos of other solids, and a deduction for milk fluids because there's transportation costs. On the expense side, there's the heifer rearing cost, which is simply a linear function of the number of days from birth to first calving. That's, that's quite easy. Then there are overhead costs uh, for cows while they're in milk or dry. And the overhead cost is the same whether a cow is in milk or dry. It's, it's overhead. You're occupying a space in the barn. And then there's maintenance feed costs for lactating cows and maintenance fees costs for dry cows. And obviously for lactating cows, these maintenance feed costs are, are higher, substantially higher. Then we also have marginal feed costs. Uh, and, and so those are the costs that we are allocating per, for producing a kilo of fat or a kilo of protein. And we know it actually costs more to produce a kilo of protein because of the high cost of the feeds you need to give them per kilo to get a, an extra kilo of protein. And we have supply management system in Canada, so there's also a quota opportunity cost. Our supply management system is on a kilo of fat basis, so there is an opportunity cost in the formula related to that kilo of fat that every cow produces because you fill your quota. So when we looked at defining profit, we were looking at how do we define it, and we, we, we decided and agreed as an industry we were going to uh, define profit as accumulated profit to six years of age. This distribution shows the age at first age in months at calving for third calvings in red and fourth calvings in blue. So you can see that a lot of animals, or the early animals by five years of age or 60 months, they started calving for the fourth time. Um, but we decided to choose 72 months of age as the point because then we would include their profit during fourth lactation in our calculation of profit. Other cows, however, by 72 months of age are still calving for the third time. They're late. They had long intervals. Maybe they started late on their first calving and had problems breeding back, et cetera, et cetera, and really only calve for the third time by the time they reach six years of age. You can see by this curve over here on the right-hand side, there are some cows calving for the fourth lactation only at 84 months or seven, seven years of age. So we wanted to pick a profit definition that was consistent in terms of a fixed age not a fixed stage of reproductive or productive performance like third calving, fourth calving, fifth calving. So this is the definition we're going with for our new profit-based index. And the way we have to do that then was conduct an analysis and we calculate the accumulated profit to six years of age. To do that, I included cows born between January 05 and September 08. I did this analysis in the fall of last year or the winter months here. And, and basically, I needed to make sure every cow had the opportunity to reach six months of age. And then I calculated the profit for each cow up until that point in time. We had roughly 700,000 cows in my analysis. Uh, and, and basically, what you end up with is uh, cows that are culled, let's say, somewhere in third lactation or in second lactation. If that's as far as they got and then they were culled, that was their profit to six years. If they didn't make it that far, they got called before for some other reason. They have a more limited profit than if they were able to stay in the herd, keep going, and the farmer kept them, and they lasted the six years, 
And obviously, if you have four, four lactations before you reach six years of age, you're going to have more profit than if you only calved later on. So there is some function of longevity and production levels and reproductive performance and all of those things that are coming into play in this definition of profit. So I had to calculate the accumulated profit to six years for each of these 700,000 cows. I did the same for Ayrshire's and Jersey's, by the way, and other breeds. And then I averaged the profit to six years across all daughters of a given sire, of each sire. And I ended up with 830 sires, and I had to eliminate those sires who were preferentially used in Canada as imported semen into Canada. So I'm restricting it to those that were young sires used in Canada and produced a lot of daughters. And I only limited to those sires that had at least 100 daughters with the profit data in it. So I didn't have any, any biases in there. This cow, actually, I'm, I'm showing her here. She's the highest Holstein for profit to six years in Canada based on that data set that I had of 700,000. She ends up producing in, in, in uh, six years of age, she was 1,300 days in milk. She produced over 170,000 pounds of milk, 7,400 pounds of fat, and almost 5,600 pounds of protein. She has costs, uh, income of, of, of 66,000, expenses of about 33,000, and a profit to six years of $30,000. No problem with this cow making money to her owner. I thought I'd throw this one in as well. This is the association between the lifetime profit or profit to six years as a function of age at first calving. And you can clearly see that cows calving, these are Holsteins, cows calving at 22, 23 months of age are going to have more lifetime profit to six years of age than if you start them off and calve them later. In Canada, our average age at first calving is, in Holsteins is 27 months. So there is suboptimal, suboptimal opportunity for profit, uh, profit to six years amongst these cows. In my analysis, there were three main components. The first was to quantify the relationship between the LPI that we're currently publishing, lifetime profit index, and the actual profit that those bull's daughters achieved. So we wanted to quantify what does our current LPI, how is our current LPI related to profit? of their daughters. And then secondly, develop a better equation or the best possible equation to have some index that's even better associated with the profit of their daughters. And then the third area was to compare the expected response achievable or realized on a trait by trait basis when you select for this index or that index or another index. So this shows the relationship between the LPI of a sire on the bottom scale and the average lifetime profit to six years of their daughters. The correlation there is 73%. And you can generally see it's the, all these bulls, these red dots are bulls. They're not all on that black line. There is some variation in there. But I think we have to understand that a correlation of 73% between a sire's proof and the actual realized profit of their daughters is a pretty good correlation, recognizing that profit is not only genetically based. There's a lot of management in profit. There's a lot of environment in profit. And these genetic evaluations leading to a phenotypic performance of profit is a, is a, really, good, a really good tool to promote lifetime profit index. So from this, in the three breeds, I can now conclude that Every time you look at two sires that are 100 LPI point difference today with our current formula, in it's the Holstein or Ayrshire or Jersey breed, a 100 point difference between two sires is roughly $170 more profit to six years of each daughter of those bulls. So now we can say, if you want to use LPI as your selection index and select between bulls, here is the profit difference that you're going to achieve on average in their daughters. So again, talking dollars and talking money. So then when we define the profit-based index, we can use regression analysis to predict daughter average profit to six years using the sire's proofs for different traits as the input to do the prediction. 
So we use the production traits. We use the key type traits. And you'll, re you'll recall that confirmation is simply a composite trait, similar to a composite trait of mammary system, feet and legs, dairy strength, and rump. And each of the linear traits are actually within, let's say, the mammary traits are within mammary. So you don't need to include all the linears, and you don't need to include the overalls, the overall confirmation. Those four functional confirmation, to overall confirmation traits are sufficient. And then a series of functional traits like herd life, which is like the PL in, 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 in here in, in, in the US, somatic cell score, daughter fertility, which is like the new fertility index in the US, body condition score, milking speed, milking temperament, uh, which we have in Canada and, and not in the US, calving ability, which is a combination of calving ease and your stillbirth rate, uh, on a sire's uh, usage, uh, so from the sire side, and daughter calving ability is an index that combines calving ease and stillbirth rates on the, on the cow side, on the daughter side. So then when you can have, you build the profit index, on the bottom now is the sire's profit index, uh, and on the right hand side here is the expected progeny, uh, expected profit of their daughters to six years of age. And here you can see the slope is one, so there is a 100% concordance between the scale of expression of this new profit index, let's say 4,000 or 3,500, go up 3,500, go across 3,500. If a bull has a profit index of 3,500, the average profit of their daughters is 3,500. Now, what we've decided in the end is to not express these proofs in those actual magnitude. They're going to be as a deviation from the average, from a base because uh, just, just as a difference, a difference, so that way you can say one is 2,000 or 2,500, the other one's 2,000, then that's a better profit than the average bull or the average cow, etc. This chart shows the relative weights in LPI that currently exist. So if you take my LPI formula and you partition it out by trait by trait, you can see protein has 29% of the emphasis, daughter fertility has 10% uh, of the emphasis, uh, mammary system has 13.6. So this is the relative weights, the relative emphasis placed on each trait in our LPI formula. And, and I know you can do the exact same thing for the TPI formula. You, you can see that. My message here, though, is that this is the actual expected response on a trait-by-trait -trait basis when you select for LPI. That's funny, eh? There's no weight on milk in LPI, but you get a response for milk. There's no weight on confirmation, but you get a great response of 0.59 for confirmation. The point being here that just because a trait isn't in your index doesn't mean that you're not going to make progress for that trait. And why is that? It's due to correlated response. This is a big matrix of correlations of all these traits. And, and in green, it's the correlations that are in the positive sense over 10%. And in red, they're the negative correlation or antagonistic related traits uh, under 10%. And all the white ones are somewhere in plus or minus 10%, not really significantly different than zero. So yes, if you're going to select for fat and protein yield in your index, you're going to achieve a correlated response for milk because they're correlated to each other. So basically this whole, and the same thing with confirmation and the mammary traits. So I don't think in Canada, and I'm not so sure what, 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 what perception or knowledge or extension adoption, I know there has been an extension effort by AIPL and USDA in the past about selection indexes and correlated responses and expected responses. But in Canada, we haven't done that very well. So we're basically changing our philosophy and saying relative weights in a specific selection index formula are way less important than people perceive. In fact, I would argue they create confusion rather than clarity. Our lesson's been learned in LPI. This is why it takes me such a long time for our industry to agree on a modified LPI formula. We're talking about whether dairy strength should be 5 or 10% or not at all in the formula or whether fat should be something a little more than protein or back and forth. 
you, you, you spend so much time with the detail of how much weight a given trait gets or whether a trait is in it or not, that really all you need to look at is what is the response you want from an index and build the index to give the desired selection response. So in our new profit-based index, you will not see the formula. There is no formula published for our new profit-based index. And it's basically because it's based on regression coefficients rather than relative weights. It, it doesn't need that, that, that formula. You don't need to understand or to have an understanding of what is the number that multiplies in the formula for each trait to get it to the index. We want to teach people that you're better when you select for that index, this is the response you're going to get. And there's no question that the index will be in dollar values. So right now here at this presentation, I'm not presenting what the LPI option, what the LPI formula will be in August because we're still in discussion. In any event, the LPI formula, uh, there are two or three candidates uh, that are at the high end of the list of, of narrowing down, and all I've done is kind of average them up. So you're not going to really see what the LPI formula is going to be, but it's some, some guide about where LPI is moving to compared to where it currently is. This graph on my side here, on your, on your left, basically shows the, shows the traits where the new LPI formula will have a higher selection, re selection response or expected response compared to the existing LPI. So we're going to increase our response for mastitis resistance, somatic cell, longevity, daughter fertility, daughter calving ability, mammary conformation and feet and legs. There will be, the new LPI formula will have a higher response for those traits compared to the current LPI. On the other end, on the right-hand side, are traits where we will be, have a lower expected response. So those are temperament and percent, you know, fat, protein percent, a little bit on milking speed, but basically it's milk, fat, and protein yields. So the new LPI formula will be reducing the expected response to selection for yields and increasing it for the major functional type traits to some degree and also to the key functional traits. When I compare the average of the LPI options to the new profit-based index, then we can see, again, on this side, on the left-hand side of the screen, are the traits where the profit index is actually going to have a higher expected response compared to the, what we look, what seems to be the new LPI formula. Their body condition score, somatic cell, milk yield, and herd life are going to be more emphasized in, those, in that formula while fat kilos, mammary system conformation, feet and legs, both fat and protein differentials or percentages, and dairy strength will be less emphasized in the new profit index. These traits in the middle, daughter fertility and mastitis resistance with protein yield and rump, will be very, very similar expected responses in both the LPI formula going forward and our new profit-based index. This is what the top 100 proven sires uh, for each of these indexes looks like. And it just kind of quantifies a little bit what that expected response translates to. And you can see quickly that in the profit index, you're going to have more selection for milk yield than either the current or the new the proposed LPI formula going forward. Uh, uh, and, uh, and a similar uh, level or probably more advanced level of protein than the LPI going forward and definitely in the functional traits of somatic cell, mastitis resistance and herd life. This is the list of the top 15 LPI sires today uh, in yellow ranked from 1 to 15. And uh, then on, uh, you could see how they would rank uh, based on the average formula of what we're talking about for LPI plus the six years, uh, the six year profit formula. So you can see that there is basically six new bulls that would enter into the top 15. So we're not, 
reinventing. We're not just wiping out these high LPI bowls and saying they're all garbage. There is an overlap between these two indexes. Uh, but at the same time, some of the higher LPI bulls will rank lower, as low as below 20 to 48 on the, on the profit index basis. And if you rank them by the new profit index, you could see there are bulls coming in from the current LPI that are ranked below number 20 up to number 49 there, 48, 49, coming into the top 15. So there's a shuffling around a little bit of some of these bulls depending on their profile of their traits, strengths, and weaknesses. So in summary, in terms of Canadian evaluations, we have introduced various improvements uh, to reduce and eliminate overestimation of genomic young bulls and heifers. There's a new LPI formula to come in August, and, and by the way, it will also include an adjustment to credit outcross genomic young sires. So the formula will be modified, and if you have a genomic out, outcross genomic young sire, uh, it will have a higher credit, a higher LPI than otherwise. And if the genomic young sires are not outcross, then it actually will have a lower LPI. So it helps to shift the, the, the ranking of genomic young sires to give greater exposure to genomic young sires on the list. The new profit-based index will be expressed in dollars. It will be introduced, we know for sure, in the Holstein and Jersey breeds. The Ayrshire breed has determined that their LPI modifications are going in the same direction as what the profit research was showing, and they were already getting close to a 96, 97, 98 percent correlation, so they decided to go even further and just modify LPI to be closer associated with the results of the profit work rather than introducing two indexes in a breed of relatively small population size. I expect that to be the outcome in all of the other color breeds in Canada. So definitely Holstein and Jerseys, but maybe not for the other breeds at all. We have appointed an industry-wide uh, promotion committee, uh, including AI breeds, DHI, all together to develop a, a promotional and, and extension campaign for both the new LPI and the new profit-based index. We're also going with weekly genomic evaluations starting in April. Our genomic evaluations will be official each week. They are exactly calculated the same as any other monthly or any other evaluation. Uh, will be complete calculations and official uh, uh, published on the Tuesday of each week on our website uh, at noon. So you can finish the U.S. stuff first and then come and look at, uh, at noon for our website. Um, so that'll occupy the whole day, Roger. <clears throat> um, the, it will be focusing on obviously newly genotyped females. You don't need to update animals that already have a genomic evaluation. But once a bull in an AI company is known to be owned by or controlled by an AI company, then each week the new bulls will also become official as soon as the AI company wants to make them official. So to coordinate and manage this new uh, flow of information, which has become an overflow of the bucket, uh, our board of directors has decided to launch new data management services. And this is really why we didn't go weekly earlier in January or February. We, didn't want, we wanted to coordinate the service delivery with the ability to manage that service delivery. So we're introducing four new management, data management services, and one is a, 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 a way to manage top genomic hiffers that change every week. Uh, also, evaluations by an owner prefix. So in Canada, every breeder has a breeder prefix, and if they're an owner of an animal, they can get their own animals up uh, on our website and manage that and download it in Excel. If it's a foreign animal, then we can work by the actual prefix of the animals because we don't know the change of ownership on foreign animals. Um, then two others that are more specific for companies that are nominators, female genomic details by nominator or requester, and male genomic details by nominator or requester. So these are quite detailed uh, files uh, 
that they would receive on a weekly basis automatically. Uh, those files already exist if you're a CDN member organization, but this service then becomes available to pers for those to subscribe to uh, if you're not a CDN member organization. So both of those three and four will be more internationally based companies looking to get Canadian based genomic evaluations on their males and females. Um, all of these will be offered on a 12 month subscription fee. So you sign up and you sign up for 12 months like getting a magazine every week. And then you can spend your time reading your magazine. Thank you very much for your time, Roger. I remain here today and tomorrow. If you have any other questions or discussion points, then welcome, uh, welcome any feedback and questions. Well, thanks, Brian. That's, uh, yeah, you guys can hear me there. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I think uh, certainly a load of information, and uh, it's always interesting to, you know, to note how you started out and addressing the issues that, uh, you know, were, were on the table at the time and, and bringing them forward. I think that's really uh, crucial to, uh, to the progress that you've made and, and noting how you can move those uh, forward. So I think that was a, a really interesting uh, the way you open that with your with your current issues and how you address them. So, um, any we're pretty much on time, but uh, certainly Brian's uh, valuable, and I do ask if anybody uh, on the floor at the current time would uh, like to come to the mic and uh, have a couple uh, questions for for Brian. Lloyd. Uh, Lloyd Seaman, I'm curious uh, on your outcross uh, adjustment up for some and adjustment down. Uh, what did you, or how did you arrive at that? And I, I'm certainly concerned about the inbreeding levels, and just a little more information on, on how that's going to be implemented. Okay. Um, so there are um, a couple of reasons why uh, genomic young sires um, evaluations might change when they become proven. So from the point of being a young sire to a point of when they're progeny proven. And uh, uh, part of that change will relate to how closely those young bulls are genetically related to the population. So one way of looking at it and expressing it is what uh, you do in the US where you say, what is the average inbreeding coefficient that you expect of those progeny of that bull if he was randomly mated in your population? We have a similar tool to measure that. We call it the relationship value. It's an R value, and it's basically double that inbreeding. So in our case, if we had a number of 14, then we expect the average inbreeding of their progeny of this bull to be seven if that bull was used randomly in our population. If it's down at six, then you expect the average inbreeding of the progeny to be three. So we are using that relationship value to determine the level of adjustment. But the research that we did beforehand was one, uh, to basically look at what's the decrease that happens based on that level of our value. Because an animal that is more related to the population will have a higher average inbreeding rate of their progeny and therefore they will have less variation in, in, in their performance. And so that will generally reduce the ability of a sire to deviate from its parent average. In Canada, we do not account for inbreeding levels of progeny in our model of methods of genetic evaluation. Our scientists don't believe that that's correct. We can argue that separately if you like. But point is that it can happen, and it's basically a result of uh, inbreeding depression or what happens over the course of time. So, in addition to that research, we generally simply agreed that we need to do something to better balance the rate of genetic progress that's happening versus the increasing, the subsequent and correlated increase of inbreeding that would happen. So we're trying to introduce something that could help balance that out to some degree. I think that was good, Lloyd. I think the outcross question was uh, certainly on my list as well, and how, how you can adapt to it. And, and certainly, I'm sure there'll be some, uh, you know, reviews as you go along as you as you project exactly. them. Um, George, I was I was interested in your uh, six year profitability, and my question really is that uh, I think the goal is profitability per farm. I think you're doing profitability per cow. 
And I think that over penalizes the cow that leaves early because her stall is available for a subsequent cow. Sure. So uh, there are two things here. This is uh, genetic selection of sires. So it's meant to say which are the best sires to lead to the profitability of the daughter, daughter profitability. Um, obviously, DHI continues to provide a service that provides profitability values on each cow to help them manage better profitability at the herd level. So there is a distinguished difference between them. One is the management service to help herd profitability be maximized, and the other one is sire selection to contribute to improved profitability over the, by, the selection, by the use of the daughters. So there are different, slightly different goals, I, I get it. Uh, but they are related to each other. And what we feel is a tremendous asset is that something we're using for genetic selection is also something available. It's a phenotype available at the farm level. It's the same profit numbers. Just related with that, uh, Paul, sorry, go ahead. Uh, just related with that, uh, Brian, as you talked about your new profit index, you know, you talked about some more weightings on, on milk and protein. And looking at the you know, earlier in your, in your conversation, you talked about the uh, Canadian dairy producer being paid on his kilo of fat. I, my question is, um, you is, are you aiming this uh, new profit index towards the Canadian producer or more as a global producer or, or a combination of both? And uh, just reflect on that if you would, please. So for sure, um, um, part of... Uh, Part of the profit index has to be based on what are Canadian dairymen going to achieve. So uh, to be clear, the formula does have credit for each kilo of fat and kilo of protein. The difference that might make it a little bit unique from an international acceptance perspective is the fact that there is a penalty or an expense related to opportunity cost for quota which makes fat kilos a little less important in their outcome than, than protein or milk. Um, I think there are many countries in the world where fat counts less uh, and milk counts for more. Uh, so I do think that this profit-based index will see a lot of international interest. Um, and it's no different than what net merit has done. It's in US dollar terms and it has international merit and recognition. So I don't see it. Yes, you build something for focusing on your national audience, but it'll have huge international uh, buy-in, I expect, as well. And certainly, the, so go, certainly that's a, a good response. And, and I think, you know, Canada's challenged, or you're not challenged, I'd say, you know, has uniqueness with its milk supply management, so you have to take that uh, into consideration going Absolutely. globally as well. Uh, Paul Hunt, please. Oh, sorry, I missed the opportunity to get you on the board table. So. I'm struggling with the lack of transparency on the components on the profit index mm -hmm. because, as you stated earlier, when you looked at the different cows, different producers have different profits from different types of cows. So how is a producer to use that index to his own optimal benefit if he's not sure, if he's using a population-based figure that he then can't deconstruct and say, well, I need more weight on protein or I need more weight on another trait? without that transparency of components? So there is a couple of things. Uh, if, you, if you really want, uh, anybody, anybody can take, uh, well, the, the fir first answer, of the, the first primar primary part of my response is that these are regression coefficients which cannot be interpreted in the same way as relative weights. So they are very different because automatically they consider the genetic correlation structure amongst all traits, which, which is very different. Uh, the second thing is um, we in Canada believe this is to be very novel and new and an innovative way to define the profit. It's not been used anywhere in the world like this, but has strong scientific merit to do so. So part of it is from an industry of intellectual property and say, why do we need to publish all of our numbers for the rest of the world or someone else just to mimic? So there is that component of it, I'll be frank. Uh, but most importantly, if you really want to, I can build an LPI formula and show it to have the weights if you really want to. 
we won't intend to do so, and I think from a farmer perspective, AI companies will need to understand that you can have a mating program that allows them to customize their weights, and we can help them understand if we can provide them the tools, if they want to have more gain from mastitis resistance than this formula gives them, they'll know how to adjust for that in the mating programs. Albert? Long Brian. time no see. Brian, Albert Röhring, yes. accelerated, but foreigner. Um, I'm really intrigued regarding the information on fertility. Probably the Holstein breed has been most criticized about our daughter fertility. When you demonstrated the number one cow in Canada, she wasn't really a fertile cow. No. And in the old LPI, there was zero sort of genetic progress or, uh, well, let's call it zero genetic progress. In the new LPI, relatively still limited. So I would like you to, to help us understanding are we overestimating maybe a little bit the value of our daughter fertility in our selection? And on the other hand, that, old, that nice number one cow had long lactations, but we are using a standardized 305 or 365 day lactation. Is that maybe also something for reconsidering? Both questions are very, very relevant and similar to some of the conversation discussion we've had in Canada. Um, bottom line is that years ago we used to say cows needed to calve at 12 month intervals. Now we accept longer intervals. And, and really it's, in my opinion, a desirable or optimum calving interval really is a function of the shape of the lactation curve. And that particular cow that I showed you, um, you could see that she had very high levels of production and it might not have been optimal for her to give some of that energy and resources to a pregnancy when she was making great money on the production side. So I don't see these things as so structured to say every cow has an, the same ideal calving interval. I think that calving interval needs to be managed based on animals or herds and the profit that they're achieving while in milk. And, and maybe that's part of the services we can help provide and say for this cow there's an optimum pregnancy date and this cow there's a different optimum pregnancy date. I, I do think that you know we show here and that's why I'm trying to say that profitability is not solely a function of fertility. Fertility doesn't have 80% of the weight in the formula or even 20% of the weight in the formula. It is a contributor to it. But if you're making money producing milk and its components, then uh, the, the, the need to reproduce that. In fact, I have one of my highest profitability cows. She calved once and she was 1,900 days in milk. She's one of the highest. 1,900 days in milk to six years of age. So I can't, if that's what the farmer wants to make, how he makes his profit, and he doesn't get a calf out of it, and doesn't do all that stuff, that's his decision too, so. I think, uh, Albert, that's a great question. I think fertility has certainly been on the forefront for, you know, a number of years, and how we can improve it, and I think there's always gonna be, uh, you, know, you know, trickles to the equation to make it just a little bit better, and um, in cows, is, there's always examples like Brian used in his long lactation cow that uh, can be profitable, but uh, I certainly don't expect that uh, you'd want a herd of 1,900-day lactation cows either. So, exactly. Um, or a group of daughters of a bull with that. That's exactly Same right, thing. sure, <laughs> absolutely. It multiplies the, the problem. I think at this time we've kind of uh, had a tremendous morning and uh, with wrap up, it's certainly it's uh, coming to a little bit of a lunch time here that I would like to um, uh, address that we would like to try and get back in here within about one hour if we could. Um, it's not unlike Brian to stretch